You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. The Susquehanna River, the Juliet, the whole, let's say Susquehanna system, it is so big, it's almost injustice to think of it as one unique body of water. And you could break that down into multiple sections of the Susquehanna and spend so much time just talking about that. And then one part of the Susquehanna is the Juliata. And I've heard rumors and fable tales of this place. And I'm really, thank you for coming on just so we can talk about this. Sure. Yeah, the the Juniata is, I did a little bit of Google work here. Um, I I think it's classified as 104 miles, um, you know, in length. Uh, it gets up, the main stem goes up and it splits off into the Frankstown branch and the Raystown branch. Uh, of course, uh, the Raystown branch has the Raystown uh, dam and the reservoir. You had a guest on uh, sometime here in the past couple of months that talked about that. Um, and, you know, so I think technically the Juniata is the, the second largest tributary to the main stem of the Susquehanna except for the West branch of the Susquehanna, you know, so that sort of puts it in perspective. The West branch is big and the Juniata is, I mean, it's not as big as the Susquehanna, but it's pretty big. So yeah, it cover, covers cool. a lot of land and, you know, mostly rural. Um, you know, I think the biggest, um, probably the biggest population center that's on the Juniata is, is either Lewistown or Huntington, you know, and both of them are, a fraction of, of what Harrisburg is, you know, it's, we don't have near the urban impact uh, on the Juniata that the, that the Susquehanna gets from all over the place. And, and I think we, we just mentioned this before we started uh, recording, but where do you live? How close do you live to the Juliata and, and the river system? Yeah. So I'm, <laughs> I, if I hook to my boat within three minutes, I can be launched. Um, you know, two That's good awesome. stone throws down across route 322 here and I can be in the river. So, um, you know, I'm there every chance I get. And uh, it, it's kind of interesting being a multi-species angler and then, you know, fishing year round. Um, I love to see the changes in the seasons, uh, you know, not only not only on the land, but also the changes that happen in the water and, uh, you know, the way you change, the way you target species and things like that. Um, and being close allows me to get a real good look at that. Where did your love of fishing really begin? Well, you know, as a, as a young kid, uh, we did a lot of uh, trout fishing for stalkers, you know, in the local streams here. And as I got older, I sort of became disenchanted with chasing stock fish. And, um, you know, I'm a farmer. We have a farm here uh, right next to the river. And, you know, so we work a lot of long days, but usually there's a little bit of time at the end of the evening um, you know, where you can get down on the water. So you even going back to like, you know, around 2000 or something like that, I was probably like a junior in high school. Um, you know, we go down almost every evening and, you know, try to get on a top water bite or whatever. And, um, you know, that's really the root of, of where I got my love for, for fishing the Juniata. Um, you know, but just shortly after that, uh, you know, towards like 2002 through 2005, we actually had a pretty big population collapse in the, the smallmouth fishing. Um, it got really poor. Um, wow. There were still some fish in there, but it, it wasn't good. Um, so that was kind of like when I left for college, um, you know, first jobs and that sort of thing. And, you know, time elapsed. And, you know, here about three years ago, I got back into it again. And, and sort of immerse myself in it and, you know, just trying to learn as much as I can because it's, it's too much fun not to. I mean, it really is. And when you say multi-species, I mean, does the, what does the Juliata have to offer when it comes to fish species right now? Or what do you like to really catch, you know? Well, it, it's, it's seasonal. Um, so like smallmouth bass, obviously, are, are the biggest, uh, most common uh, game fish here. Um, pretty much through the, through the entire river system. It's, it's a smallmouth bass fishery. Um, really the, the trophy quality, uh, can be seasonal on the lower portions. We get some fish, you know, that push up out of the Susquehanna during the spawn and things like that. Uh, so there's some windows, uh, where there's maybe more big fish than, than what there is other times a year. Uh, but across the board, it's doing pretty good right now. Um, so there's smallmouth bass, 
um, especially in the spring, uh, during the pre-spawn, um, I really like to get after catfish as well. And that kind of, you know, stems back to being a farmer and being busy through the day. A lot of times I don't have a chance to get out. And of course I have kids that play sports and everything. So sometimes the only time I have to get out is after dark and, um, you know, I just can't let it alone. So, uh, we get after channel cats. Um, of course the, the famous flathead on the Susquehanna, yeah. they've obviously, <laughs> they've obviously pushed their way up. Uh, mm. they're, they're the whole way up to, to pretty much the raised town dam. Uh, they've, they've infiltrated the whole system. So we have them everywhere now. And, um, you know, just this past year, um, I, I started chasing muskies and <laughs> that's a different discipline altogether. Um, what do you think I of that? Call them, I, it's, um, wow. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's its own thing, man. Like yeah. just because you like to fish for smallmouth and stuff like that doesn't mean you're going to like fishing for muskies. You, you got to be willing to spend inordinate amounts of time with zero success. Um, you know, and wait for that one big payoff and that's not for everybody. And then of course, you know, with muskies, you know, we really don't fish for them during the summer. Uh, water temps get a little too high. They get stressed. Uh, you can have that delayed mortality that everyone talks about. So that's pretty much like a fall through winter thing. So, you know, we'll fish for muskies in, you know, 34 or 33 degree water, whatever it is. Um, you know, we get out there and get after them. And, you know, most days it's for nothing, uh, but it sure makes it sure makes the successful times that much more memorable. So, yep, yeah, small mouth. <laughs> Channel cats, flatheads, and muskies. Um, we have some people that chase carp. Uh, for the most part, the, the the bow fishermen have really taken care of the carp. There's We still have some, but we don't have the big schools like we used to, that's for sure. And big fish are hard to come by. What is the difference between the Juliata? Just if you compare and contrast the Juliata to the Susquehanna, is it basically the same thing or is it a completely different ecosystem? No, it's different. Um, and even the Juniata is, uh, it really differs too. Like the, the technically like what I would be on would be considered the part of the lower river. And down here it, it's, um, it's a lazy river. Um, we have, you know, big pools and, and the pools are not deep. It's still a shallow river. Um, you know, the, the stretch that I fish most of the time, you know, a deep pool might have eight feet of water in it at normal flow. Um, you know, you're looking at, you know, six wow. to 10 foot deep pools. Um, and then, you know, the riffles, even the riffles in the shallow areas are still pretty lazy uh, by river standards. Now, if you go up the river, um, you know, towards, uh, if anybody wants to look it up on the maps, but more up towards like, you know, Newton, Hamilton, Mount Union, uh, Mapleton up in there, there's a lot more gradient on the river up there. So there's a lot more drop. Uh, the river is, it's not as wide because you're further up the, the watershed, um, mm. but it's, it's dropping more rapidly. So you have a lot more current, um, you know, the eddies are maybe a little more pronounced than what they are down on, on our section of the river, the lower river, uh, where it's lazier. So, you know, and in, in c contrast to that, like, the Susquehanna is super, super wide, you know, yeah. like I mean, there's places it, it's commonly, you know, three quarters of a mile wide. Um, you know, the Juniata is maybe 200 yards wide or something like that, you know, down here on, on the lower part of the river. And like I said, as you go up the river, it, it's, it's less than that. It's maybe more like a hundred yards uh, wide. So there, there's differences within the Juniata itself. Um, you know, as to how it fishes and how it handles. Um, but I can't say that it's, that it's like the Susquehanna either. They're, they're kind of different, different animals. Yeah. That is really oh, interesting and, because, uh, you know, just to, sorry, Go ahead. Yeah, and another big difference between the, the, the lower Juniata and the Susquehanna is the Susquehanna, I think has a lot more ledge networks to fish. Um, you really got to get down pretty low on the Juniata, like from, uh, there's a launch at, it's called Howe Township. So it would be just south of Newport. Um, so between Newport and the confluence with the Susquehanna there at Clark's Ferry, 
there's some there's some pretty pronounced ledge systems that look like the Susquehanna down there, but you're only talking about maybe the last you know ten miles of the river. So there's you know ninety miles above that that really don't look like the Susquehanna that much at all. Wow. Okay. Which one's cleaner? Like, uh, which one has the better water water clarity when it comes to visibility? Is it the Susky or the Julieta? Uh, the Juniata has its times when it's clear. Um, I would say on average, the Susquehanna might have a little better clarity. Um, the Juniata gets one of the things that, that really does happen to the Juniata, especially in the summer. Um, and I should say the lower part of the Juniata, which is what I'm most familiar with. We have a lot of grass, um, submerged grass. Um, I believe technically it would be wild celery, but you know, we have these big beds of that stuff and they're constantly breaking loose. And I, I believe Jeff Little in one of his videos said that the Juniata sheds like a dog and that that's pretty accurate. I mean, sometimes we're limited on, you know, what lures we can fish based on what the grass will allow you to do effectively. Um, and so when the water gets low, the Juniata can be crystal clear. Uh, but I think the Susquehanna probably spends more time clear than what the Juniata does on average. But that's just any, my estimate. Is there any, with all that vegetation, uh, is there a decent largemouth population? Do largemouth play any factor in just day to days? That's crazy. No, I mean, we, I have seen, I've seen a few largemouth caught out of the river, uh, but all dinks. I've never seen anything with any size to it at all. Um, and I'm really, I'm really not sure why that is, but it's, it's, pretty much exclusively smallmouth. Hmm. And uh, I don't even think I mentioned this before, but what type of boat are you running? Well, <laughs> I'm a little bit of a jack of all trades on that. I have a, it's an old jet boat. Um, it's a, it's a 16 and a half foot express. Uh, and I have just like a, oh, nice. a 50, 35 jet on that. Um, so I can't run the places where the guys with the fancy rock proofs and stuff like that can run. Um, but I can get around fairly decent. Um, but then I also do, I do some kayak fishing, uh, from time to time, especially when the water gets lower oh, cool. and like, that's something that I would stress, you know, to anybody, um, you know, that really wants to learn how to catch fish, do everything that you can, you know, if, if you have access to a boat, get on the boat, but don't ignore wading or bank fishing or kayak fishing, um, because while you may be chasing the same species, the discipline changes um, based on what you can do. You, if you're on the bank or if you're waiting, you can work a pocket much more efficiently than you can from a boat, but you can't cover water like you can from a boat. You know, so there's, there's all these little aspects um, of how you fish that change with what you're fishing from or mm -hmm. whether you're on foot. And I think there's a lot to be learned uh, you know, from each of those disciplines that, that can be transferred anytime you're out on the water, you know, trade-offs, trade-offs, trade-offs. Yep. Yep. No, that, that, that's well said because I do think people, some people, and I, and I, I try to, I, I need to do a better job of this because every time I put a episode out, I know like last week, guys, I had an episode that talked about using the CNO canal trail in the upper Potomac, this beautiful long bike trail that, that covers the whole upper Potomac. And I had a, a, a Warren on talking about bank fishing and waiting and using that thing. That episode went viral and I, and I keep being reminded that there is a big population of people out there that don't have a boat or a kayak that do bank fish. Yeah. And there are ways that you can get it done from the bank. And in some instances, it's even better to be fishing from the bank. Yeah. Like, you know, just as an example in the winter, when I'm chasing smallmouth, I'll back up one step here before I start. Uh, one of the problems on the Juniata um, is a lot of the bank is privately owned. You know, so you're, oh. you're going to have to get permission. Um, you know, there's not a lot of, there's some public land that, that jo adjoins the river, but a lot of it is private. And uh, so you may have to get permission or find those little public parcels or maybe people that don't post their property, whatever it may be. But in the winter, um, I found some spots, you know, where I know the bass like to be in the wintertime. And I much, much, much prefer fishing them from the bank than I do from the boat. And, and one of the reasons being, depending on their mood that day, you don't know exactly which part of the pool they're going to be sitting in. And it's much easier to pick that pool apart 
slow and controlled and try to find the fish to me from the bank than it is from the boat, you know, where you're dropping anchor or you're messing around with, you know, spot lock and boat positioning and all those kinds of things. When you're on the bank, there's a aspect there where things just get simplified and, um, you know, really just lets you hone in on what you're trying to do. And that's fine fish. And I, I think mm-hmm. especially in the winter time, it's, it's a great thing. You know, if you can find those eddies that are close to the bank or whatever, and, and nobody's out there bothering you, you know, that time of year, there, there's no competition. And, and, and speaking of uh, time of year, we can use that as a segue. We are in the, the dog days of August now approaching yep. really September and like, yeah, really approaching September right now. What are you seeing out on the river? Um, bass, the, the small mouth are, you know, full swing summer pattern. Um, the, the, the top water bite can be a little mm. bit hit or miss, but when it's good, it's really good. Um, then you can almost always pick them up on Senkos and stuff like that. You know, wacky rig Senko. Uh, that's, that's my daughter's favorite lore. She, she can probably outfish me with a Senko and she's like nine years old. She has more patience than I do. That's for uh, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but no full swing summer mode. Um, this year is polar opposite from the last couple years in certain respects. Um, the last couple years we started the year with plenty of rain, then the rain stopped and the river got low and it got clear and it got hot. Um, I'm guessing if I went back and checked notes from last year, we're probably dealing with like 82 or 83 degree water temperatures right now, last year. And right now, uh, with the you know frequent rains that we've been getting and higher flows and, and a lot of cloudy days too. Uh, I'm not sure where we're at today, but I'm sure it's sub 80, um, you know, probably more in that 77, 78 range. And, but, but even with that being said, uh, the flows that we've been getting from the rains have never been, um, they've never been a problem. The, the, the river comes up just a wee little bit goes right back down and you know the the fish have had a pretty easy year um you know not a lot of environmental stress which is a good thing and hopefully that that kind of continues um what is the catch yeah and we also right had now? we also had really good spawning conditions this year so i'm, I'm hoping that yeah we got we recruited a good class good age class to come to come in here and that is what's so important when you're talking about river river smallmouth river ecosystems is how high water events how pollution things of that things like that will affect the year class and the spawn class uh, of, of the ecosystem now i know for the shannon right. example we always had an issue if you go look at the chart where i think it was 2017 through 2018 we had so much rain right during the spawning months and it killed right. two two to three years of, of spawn class fish and it's just so important that all those things have to hit correctly so you can get a good crop for the next generation. Yeah, no doubt. And and we were we were really good. If anything, the water was abnormally low during this year's spawn. And um, I mean, there's a I'm not going to say the names of them because the spots are too small. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but there, there's a couple <laughs> of tributaries that we that we fish a little bit when the fish are moving there in the spring. And um, yeah, I thought it was. Funny is not the word, but, you know, we'd be floating down through there and we'd be fishing and like you, the water was so clear, you could see the smallmouth, and like, they were just like scared out of their minds. And you look up and there's, you know, two or three bald eagles sitting in that stretch of the Creek, you know? And so wow. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure the wow. eagles ate a little bit better this year than what they usually do with the lower flows. But, uh, there's, there's plenty of smallmouth to go around. Certainly don't like seeing, uh, loss of those larger fish because it takes so darn long to grow them but um i guess the eagles got to eat too what, what's the catfishing like right now is this a i mean what is the prime time for catfishing well <laughs> so I, i'm not like um you know heaven's gift to catfishing or anything like that i like pre-spawn <laughs> and like to me that would be pre 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 july 4th um like april may and june um, can be really, really good. Uh, once they spawn, I have a hard time, uh, getting back on them, uh, with, with any solidarity here, um, you know, until later into the fall. And I, I don't know, I think a lot of it is just, they definitely have a post-spawn funk. Um, 
you know, just kind of like small mouth do. Um, but when they're coming out of their post-spawn funk, there's food available everywhere and they really don't have to travel far to eat. Um, you know, pre-spawn they're, they're traveling not only to find food, but also to find spawning grounds and to find mates and those sorts of things. And I think that's what leads a lot of them into your, you know, into your baits. That's, that's how you catch a lot of them. Um, we don't have the density of catfish like the lower Susquehanna has. Um, we, we're, we're not hurting for catfish. We have plenty of them, but we're certainly not polluted with them, uh, either channel, uh, channel cats or flatheads. So, um, they're definitely worth fishing for, but there's times of years that are, that are better than others. That's without a doubt. I mean, it, if you have the tackle with you, um, and this will be a good segue to that. What, what generally is, is a catfish rig for you? Yeah. Just, just a second here. Go for it. I didn't practice this beforehand, so let's see how it goes here. But, um, oh, okay, cool. Yeah. So, so we start, we got a mess here. That's pretty standard. So this is on the upper end. Uh, we got a sinker. Whoops. Sorry. We got, that's a three ounce sinker that's oh, on wow. a slide. So this just slides up and down the line. Then right underneath there, we got a little rubber bead that sort of acts as a bumper. Hmm. Um, right underneath, there it is right underneath your swivel. So, uh, that little rubber bumper protects that protects your knot from getting slammed by your weight. Uh, then I just go to, I think this is probably a 50 pound, uh, flora or actually this is just mono. Yeah. 50 pound mono leader. And, uh, to this one, this, this is an eight aught hook. Um, Ooh, that's a big dog. It, it is. They, they look like they're really large. Um, when you see them inside a flathead's mouth, they, they look like toys. You know, that those fish have just such gigantic mouths. Um, so really the, the, the big trick to catfishing, and I've, I've told so many people this, the, the real trick to choosing a hook size isn't the size of the fish that you hope to catch. Although that does play into it. It's the size of the bait that you're planning on using. You know, if you're going to use, um, you know, big sunfish or, um, you know, big suckers or something like that, then, then maybe you can go to an eight aught or a 10 aught hook, or maybe even some guys go to 12 aught hooks for flatheads. Um, uh, but it takes a pretty robust fish, uh, bait fish to carry that hook, you know, not wear them out. If you're just going to be using, you know, um, four inch or five inch sunfish or bluegills, um, they're not going to be able to carry that heavy hook. At least where I fish in current, they're going to have a hard time carrying that hook for a long time, you know, before they get tired and sort of lose some of their value um, as bait. So the, the big key is if you're going to choose a hook size, choose it in relation to the size of bait that you plan on using. So why is it so important? I mean, when you think flathead catfishing, you have to think bluegill or sunfish. It's like peanut butter and jelly. Like, that's just what you use. I mean, do you have success with it with cut bait or anything like that? <laughs> I think it's funny because when I decided I was going to learn how to fish for, for flatheads, um, you know, I watched all the videos I could and read everything that I could. And, you know, the, the vast majority of people really harp on live bait. And while live bait has its place, um, last year was a good live bait year for me. Uh, this past year, I bet cut bait out fished my live bait 10 to one. Hmm. Um, and that's just, yeah, I, I don't know whether it'll be that way next year or not. So the way it works in Pennsylvania, um, it's three rods per angler. So if I'm by myself, I can only fish one rod or, uh, sorry, I can only fish three rods. If I have somebody with me, we can fish six. Um, so I have my boat is, is arranged, uh, that I can fish six rods off the stern. Um, and that kind of works nice. You, you're always aligned with the current and you don't pick up quite as much of that grass that's, that's floating down the river when you're casting directly behind the boat. Um, but you know what the standard procedure is, at least for me at the beginning of the season is to throw roughly half live bait and half cut bait and just take notes, you know, just pay attention, be observant. And, um, you know, this year was a cut bait year and I like that a lot better because, um, well, obviously if you're using live bait 
that's only one, you know, a, a live sunfish or bluegill is only one piece of bait. But if you can use cut bait, now it's three pieces Multiple, or five yeah. pieces or yeah, whatever it is. So uh, cut baits, cut baits a lot easier if, if it can work. When you catfish, is it just basically get to the water, throw it out and hope? I mean, is there a strategy involved in where you go? Yeah, yeah, there is. So a, a lot of people, at least around here, um, and boy, I don't want this to sound the way it may sound, but maybe people that aren't quite as experienced, everybody says deep water, deep water, deep water. And there is something to be said for fishing deep water, but I found my best success. Um, I'll back up one step. I will fish deep water, like say maybe an hour before dark or something hmm. like that. A lot of times those fish will, will spend their days in the deeper pools. Uh, but at night they go out to the shallows and feed. I mean, if you think about where bass do most of their feeding, um, you know, where most of the minnows are, most of the crayfish, most of those types of things that typically tend to be in shallow water. Um, so once it's dark and, and I feel like those fish should be on the hunt, the catfish should be out hunting. Um, I mean, sometimes I'm fishing in a foot and a half of water and, um, you know, we, <laughs> I think last year we caught, a, I think that was a 20 pound flathead and we probably caught that in two feet of water, you know, so Damn. yeah, wow. they, they'll, they'll, they'll go where the food is. You know, if the minnows are up against the bank, then, then that's where they're going to be too, because they, they got to eat. So they, they got to go where the food is. And, um, you just always have to sort of keep those things in mind. And, um, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah that's, that's really, that, that's pretty much it. But like we, we catch them in deep water. So, and you asked, you know, whether there's a, a strategy involved, it depends, you know, if, if it's a, if it's just a short sit, you know, where we're going to go out maybe, um, for two hours or something like that, you know, I'll maybe only hit two or three spots, you know, during that time. So we'll pick up and move, you know, maybe every 40 minutes or something like that. Um, we fished a, a buddy and I fished a tournament in the beginning of, sorry, the middle of June, that was a flathead only tournament. And we moved, oh goodness. I, I bet we moved probably every 20 minutes. You just, and there was fish at every spot. It was uh -huh. unreal. I, th I, th I think we, it, I know for the guys that fish the Susquehanna, this won't sound like much, but we caught nine flatheads, uh, there in one night. And I think our total weight, I can't remember what it was anymore. It was well over a hundred pounds, you know, of total weight. Oof. And, um, you know, it wasn't good enough to compete in that tournament because there were some people that traveled, uh, to fish the lower Susquehanna. And, um, but we didn't want to do that. We wanted to see what we could do here at home. And I think we ended up with a three fish total of, of just under 50 pounds. And, and that's pretty much the, the class of fish that we have to work with here for our flatheads. You know, the, the big ones, um, that you can expect to catch reasonably are going to be between 15 and 20 pounds. Um, there, there's the off chance for a 25 or a 30 pounder, but for the most part, we're talking 16 to 15 to 20 pound fish. Which is still fun to catch, especially right now in the dog days of summer. A, a lot of fun. They're a lot of fun to catch. Yeah. They, <laughs> especially in current, you know, um, they, they have that flat head and it's, it's a little bit like, you know, when you put your, put your hand out the car window, you know, and you let the, you let the air push your hand up and down. And I, I think their heads are a little bit that way. You know, if you bring them up to the surface and if they want to get to the bottom, all they got to do is tuck that chin down and the current just drives them to the bottom of the river. And huh. uh, it's, so a cool. it's a unique fight. Yeah. It's, it's kind of fun. And then what about the, um, your smallmouth tackle? What, what is your go-to now? Smallmouth tackle. I mean, I keep it really simple, you know, through, through the summer here, um, you know, it's pretty much a Senko, a Ned rig or top water and like top water. I would love to be able to fish a whopper plopper. Um, they work, they do a terrific job. They catch nice size fish. Um, but there's too many times where the river is shedding too much grass and, and you just immediately are fouled, you know, either your prop stops spinning you know, or your hooks are acting like a lawn rake, you know, and they're just gathering up that grass that's floating down the river, you know, on the way in. And, uh, so I've sort of messed around a little bit this year with different types of, um, like, uh, Z-Man has a toad. I have one here. Let me grab it. A toad. Interesting. Okay. So like Z-Man has this, uh, 
what the heck's it called? Like a goat toad type of thing. And you can yeah. put that on like a, on a decent size, uh, hook and rig it weedless. And it's not as loud as a whopper plopper. Um, but it does have a similar action and you can bring it back in, you know, over nine out of 10 casts, you can bring it in clean. And, um, yeah, you know, whereas the plopper, you're maybe one out of 10 that it comes back clean. So it's just a trade off that you have to take sometimes, you know, to, to take advantage of that top water bite. It's so weird to think about catching smallmouth in grass. It's just, I, I'm not used to it personally. I don't think of grass and smallmouth, but do the, yeah. do the smallmouth are around it? Yeah, they are. Um, there's there's also large stretches of the river that do not have grass or have very sparse grass and when i say grass this is all submerged you know none of it is sticking up like if you if you picture the susquehanna in your head or any of your listeners that are familiar with the susquehanna you picture actual grass islands we don't have very many of those that there's a couple of them but most of it is is just submerged um and i believe the name for it is wild celery and it just you know it's under the water and it just just it lays over the current lays it over and it just sways back and forth and um it holds a lot of minnows it holds crayfish and and there are definitely fish that get up in that stuff and feed but it's, it's very difficult to target the fish when they're in there um so i tend to focus on either the gaps between it or the stretches of the river that don't have the grass directly um, but the problem is the grass tears loose from those grass beds and then it floats on the surface you know, the rest of the way down the river and, and you're always fighting those loose pieces of, uh, of grass. So, um, like I said, a lot of times you are kind of limited on what you can throw based on how much grass is going down the river. When does the grass, when do you start seeing the grass dissipating and breaking up as the fall approaches? Yeah. I mean, you're looking, I mean, it just kind of varies based on, you know, temperature. And then when, whenever you have high water, like last year, it stayed forever because I don't think so like going by the river gauges, um, the Newport gauge is the gauge that I use. And like four feet at Newport is a nice flow. Like you can fish almost anywhere in a jet boat there. You got to be a little careful. Um, but like summer base flow, when it's dry, it gets down to about three and a half feet. And I think we were at like three and a half feet into like late October, maybe even November last year till we got high water to sort of flush that dead and dying grass out. So, I mean, it starts to dry off in the fall when the days get shorter and the water gets colder, but at the same time, it will still hang on until you have a, you know, high water event to really, you know, sort of flush the system out, so to speak. Um, so it's a moving target, but yeah, you're definitely looking at, you know, later fall. What do you, and, and this is something I really, really want to get into as well, but, um, on, on your farm, like how much land do you have and what are you raising or what are you growing? Okay. So <laughs> I'm not exactly sure what the acreage is anymore, but I know counting, counting woodland and stuff, we're probably right around 300 acres. Um, Whew. but we have, Damn. we, we have beef cattle and then we have, um, four, uh, big chicken barns. Um, so at any given point in time, we have, you know, somewhere between 90 and hundred head of cattle. And then we have five, let's just say 130,000 chickens or something like that. Holy so, God, yeah, yeah. that's insane. Yeah, it, it takes a lot to feed the world, man. I, a lot of people don't understand that, you know, they look at the big barns and they, you know, they call it factory farming or whatever. Um, our birds have it pretty good. The company that we raise for um, cares about animal welfare. The birds are well taken care of, um, but it takes a lot of them. It takes a lot of them to feed people. So, Is it just you that runs everything? Uh, no, my brother-in-law helps me here as well. Yeah. Oh, okay. Is yeah, this, there, there, you... there's a lot to do there. So then we, you know, then we obviously we raise crops to to support the beef operation. So everything that our cattle eat is grown here. Um, you know, their bedding for in the barns is grown here. Um, so, you know, we got a lot of work to do, you know, to, to, to support that part of the operation, but yeah, beef, beef and chickens. That's the main thing. I guess that's better than dairy. I know my, my wife's mom grew up on a dairy farm and I heard the horror stories of dealing with that just de you know, sun up to sundown. It's just, that's a lifestyle. 
I, you said it. I, I always admire those folks. Um, but dairying is not a job. It is a lifestyle. And where what I do can can be somewhat of a lifestyle, there is a little bit of wiggle room uh, in the schedule. And we do have downtimes, you know, where we don't have chickens here, um, you know, that you can get away and do a couple of things every once in a while. But the, the dairy farmer doesn't have that option. Do you see anything seasonally that, that the animals hint at? Um, my wife and I talk about this a lot. Um, when she, in her job as an interpreter, she'll get certain calls. And she always says like, when the, when there's a full moon, you can tell because there's way more, uh, like hospital calls and things like that the night before. Right. Do you think animals are in tune to things like that? Temperature changes, moon phases, things like that. You know, I never really paid too much attention to it with the livestock, but I, I hear people talking like, I'm a consumer of information and that's, you know, it's part of what, what drove me to listen to your podcast uh, and ultimately for us to make this connection here that allows us to talk today. Um, but many podcasts, and I was actually just listening to a, to a musky podcast today. And that was one of the things that the, the guy was a, a guide and he said, you know, if you're on your way to the boat ramp and you see deer crossing the road, and yeah. you get out of the truck and the birds are chirping and everything's kind of active. And, you know, maybe the rabbits are hopping around over there. You know, it's going to be a good day on the water. Um, there, I think there is something to that. And I do think that there is, like, especially with the fishing, um, maybe particularly on the musky side and definitely on the catfish side as well. There is something to the moon phases. But I don't, I don't know that it's necessarily the gospel either. I think water mm -hmm. conditions a lot of times trump the, those lunar types of things. Um, but if you're like, if, if the, if the system is steady, you know, if you, if, if the water level is not rapidly rising or falling and the temperatures are kind of constant, you know, and there's not a lot of exciting things going on in the system, then I think those, those lunar events and things like that, full moon, new moon, um, they probably play a role. And I, I mean, I know like the, the, the two best nights of catfishing uh, that I've ever had were, were both on new moons, um, just dynamite. I mean, you almost can't keep them off the hook. It, it's, hmm. it gets that ridiculous sometime. Um, and I don't have an explanation for why that is, you know, is it because the night's darker? Does it have something to do with, you know, the, the moon and gravitational pull and all that? Stuff? I have no idea, but I, I don't like to miss a new moon when it comes to catfishing. It, it works for me. It's it's so funny how some of that that old old folklore kind of like does play out. I mean, it's almost like the farmer's almanac thing. Like, how the heck does that even work? But then when you have all this old information on the moon phases, and I'll be damned if sometimes that stuff doesn't work still. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I definitely think there's something to it, but I, I also I would never bet. I would never yeah. bet my fishing trip on it. That's mm -hmm. for sure. You know, I'm, I'm going to go fishing regardless of what it is and, and just let happen whatever happens. Especially on those like more elite predators. Cause I was, I forget there's a hunting podcast. They're talking about coyotes in cities and stuff and just how more elite predators are probably more affected by that stuff. So like a muskie would probably be way more affected by that thing than maybe like a channel catfish or a large mouth, something like that in an ecosystem. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't have, I don't have enough muskies to my resume because I'm relatively <laughs> new to it. And, um, you know, the, the Juniata is at least at least the lower part of the Juniata. I can't speak a lot for the upper. Um, I mean, I've been up there and I fished that some, but I don't have near the level of, of experience up there as I do, um, you know, in the lower half of the river. Uh, we're pretty low density down here for muskies. Um, I mean, you can definitely go out and you can take a, a, a mile or a two mile stretch of river and you can hit every hole that's in there and there may not be a fish there. There may not be, there may not be one in two miles <laughs> there today, wow. but you got to try, you know, you, sometimes you hit it lucky. Um, but I have friends that are far more experienced than what I am. And they were, they were going back through and looking at old moon charts versus the pictures of, of the muskies that they caught. And they claimed that there was a different, uh, a definite correlation, um, you know, between moon miners and majors and that sort of thing along with, uh, you know, when their catches tended to happen. Um, so it's anecdotal evidence, but it's evidence. Is it true? I heard a rumor in, on the old Facebook. So take that for what you will, that there are pike <laughs> actually in the upper Juliana or potentially pike in the upper Juliana. 
Ooh, but that's more than I can tell you. That's more than I can tell you. I'm, I'm not sure. I'd, I'd say it's certainly possible that there could be some up there, but I, it's, I don't think they're prevalent. Is there any trout that's not just put and take up there? Like, because if you're thinking like where, you know, Raystown Reservoir is, that water is probably cold all year round coming out of that. Lake. It is. And so like Raystown is kind of its own animal. I mean, they have muskies in there. They got some some pretty nice mm-hmm. small mouth. Um, they've got stripers. They've got lake trout. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I, I'm not familiar with, with fishing for, for those species, but I mean, it's my understanding that, you know, sometimes they're fishing for those um, for those lake trout, you know, put maybe even pushing 200 feet deep, you know, they're way down, way down in that cold water. Um, but no, there's no, there's no trout stocking directly on the Juniata river that I'm aware of. Um, but a lot of the tributaries are trout stocked. And then of course, when we have our high water events and stuff like that in the spring, some of those stalkers get flushed out into the main channel and the, the river's still cool enough that time of year where they can those stock trout can cuff it for a little while. And, um, you know, people will catch trout, but I don't know of anybody that really goes to the river to target them. Gotcha. Yeah. I was always curious because I, I figured that because the race town empties, you know, is part of the Julieta, that that section of the, that branch would always be colder than the other because that's being pulled from 200 feet deep. Yeah. And, and that far up the river also like that, that region gets pretty mountainous up there. Uh, so there's a lot of mountain streams, uh, that, that flow into that. And I imagine there's a, a pretty good spring influence, um, you know, up in that country as well. So yeah, the upper, the upper part of the river, and of course it's, it flows faster too. So it, I think it definitely stays colder up there, you know, quite a bit longer than what it does down here in the lower part of the river where it's, where it's lazy. When does the smallmouth fishing really get good in the Juliata? I mean, is, is there going to be a window coming up here between now and December? It's, I, I think it's always good except for that post spawn funk, you know, mm-hmm. it's like from like June, like late May through the beginning of July can be pretty difficult. Um, they're there and you can find them, but they're not always in the places that you'd think they would be. They're not always biting. Um, but so like I, I'll start, you know, pre spawn is always good, uh, almost no matter where you're at. Um, and like here now we are in August and moving into September, uh, we're kind of on that summer bite and it's pretty good. You can catch, um, good numbers and there's enough good fish in the river right now that you can find some size as well. But as we start to move into like, you know, October, um, you know, set late September and October, um, it's going to be a lot easier to find some of those bigger fish. And then, you know, I really like, I, I like winter fishing quite a bit. Um, you know, the area that the smallmouth are in really shrinks, you know, they're not evenly distributed throughout the system. They, they, people call them the winter holes. And I guess that's about the best you can do as far as naming them. A lot of the places where I find them in the winter aren't necessarily holes. They're just places where there's reduced current, you know, it it might only be four feet deep. Um, but there's a little bit less current there and, Sometimes I actually think they maybe even like that shallower water as long as the current's not too bad because it does warm up a little bit during the day as well. Uh, you know, once the sun gets high and everything. Um, but winter fishing is great because the, the you, everything's kind of driven on metabolism, right? So the, the small fish, um, it doesn't take much to maintain a 10 or a 12 inch bass and, and a meal lasts them a really long time. But those larger fish, they still have to eat even through the winter. And, you know, the bulk of what you catch in the wintertime are, are your nicer fish. You know, it's, your, your numbers are going to be way down, uh, but the bulk of what you catch is going to be, you know, much more in that like, you know, 16 to 18 or 20 inch range as opposed to that 10 to 12 inch range that's, that's really common to catch uh, now through the middle of the summer. I will always sing the praises of wintertime uh, smallmouth fishing. It's some of the funnest I, I I think you can have all year. Um, the bite is really good. When people think of uh, really that slow, yucky wintertime fishing, 
it's not wintertime smallmouth fishing. The biting is always better than if you're going for largemouth. So if you compare the two, I've always think like a smallmouth bite is way more fast paced than like a largemouth bite where you're barely dragging it, especially fish that live in river systems who, yeah. you know, even a bad bite, a bad river smallmouth bite is 10,000 times more fun in the winter than a largemouth bite, hands down. Yeah. It, and so sometimes it takes you a little bit of time to, to find them. Um, you know, I think I mentioned it earlier, but like it in the, well, let's just call it a winter hole, <laughs> but in the winter hole that they're in, you know, their position within that hole changes from day to day. Uh, and sometimes from hour to hour, um, you know, so you may spend a lot of time scouring a particular spot and, you know, in the winter, I throw a lot of tubes and Ned rigs and stuff like that. Just small presentations, slow, you know, a lazy drift. And, uh, and it seems to work fine, but you'll spend a lot of time trying to find those small mouth. But once you find them, you usually pop three or four, just, you know, one right after the next, um, you know, until you use up that little group of fish and then you got to move on and find the next one. Um, but I really enjoy winter fishing and there's, there's nobody out there to bother you. One thing I really wanted to make sure we, 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 we touched on while I had you here was, um, for everyone that's followed the channel, you know, I try to follow, you know, all the issues in our ecosystem, you know, from the Susquehanna, the Shenandoah, Upper James, the Chesapeake Bay watershed. And, and one thing that comes to heart to me that really was one reason for starting this channel was the fish kills on the Shenandoah river. And I got to talk to the river keepers there. I got to talk to all the biologists that talked about that and, and what happened. And, and one part of that was how much farming affected it. And I really uh, cherishing this moment I have here to where I can finally ask a farmer about all this, because I felt like it was a disservice not to have somebody on that was a farmer so that they couldn't show their point of view, because I, I think these issues are complex and multifaceted. And it's so easy as a human being to just like, let's just blame one thing and be done with it when that's not the case yeah. at all. No, I, I mean, you know, as a farmer, uh, yeah, I, I'd be lying if I said there's never pollution that, that comes off of our farm, just like anybody else's farm, you know, just, oh man, a little over, t probably three weeks ago now, uh, the one Sunday morning, we had six and a half inches of rain in like five hours. Um, I'd be very willing to bet that some pollution left our farm during that event, just like it left other people's farms or other people's businesses. Um but, you know, when I look at particularly the Juniata River watershed, probably the predominant land use is agriculture or forest, but probably agriculture. We don't have a ton of population up here. Um, we don't have big cities. Um, so if agriculture is the predominant land use, then that's probably going to be the predominant source of pollutants. Um, I think things are a lot better now than what they used to be. Um, being that we're in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, we have been pushed very, very hard uh, in a regulatory fashion uh, to adopt certain practices. Um, there's not a lot of tillage that happens up here anymore. Uh, a lot of our farming is, is done no-till. Uh, so we don't have near as much sediment pollution coming off of our farms. Um, phosphorus tends to bind to those soil particles uh, so we shouldn't be sending near as much phosphorus uh, into the into the drainage and, and eventually into the Chesapeake. Um, but we were kind of you know pushed into that no-till type of system, which it, it works great. But then we, we trade some of those uh, problems that we used to create. Now we do a lot of herbicide applications because we're not taking care of the weeds with the plow. So um, let's break that you know, down for all the people that are listening that probably I want to make sure everyone understands and grasp this. So when you say no till, I'm pretty sure there's a person says you just pick seeds up from Southern States and you just start chucking them then because you're not breaking the ground. Um, and I know someone in the comment section will say that. So when you mean no till and you're not breaking the yeah. soil, w explain that a little bit more, please. Yeah. So, so no till is, is a system that, uh, we have specialized, uh, planting equipment, our corn planters, and our drills, um, and, and some of the guys have air seeders, but let's just say our planting equipment is, is specialized that it can put the seed in the ground at the proper depth and spacing without having to plow the field first. So a lot of times that no-till equipment is heavier. Um, 
so that it can sort of push through the crust of the of the ground, you know, because it hasn't been loosened up by a plow. Um, but we can we can drag that planter or that drill, you know, across the soil, and it will just make a slot, you know, just a little tiny slot. It'll deposit the seed and it'll push it right back shut, and all the other ground around it, um, you know, has not been disturbed at all. So, um, you know, we're never dragging a plow through our fields and making everything loose and fluffy and highly erodible you know, all at one time. Um, but because we're not doing any of that tillage, you know, uh, let's just say you're going to plant corn in the spring and you have weeds out there. You go out there with your plow and you plow them under. Well, that generation of weeds is taken care of. Oh. We, we can't do that. So we have to do that with herbicide um, and multiple applications sometimes, depending on the crop and the situation. So, um, you know, Interesting. it's kind of one of those deals where we're trading one problem for another, but the reality of it is, we have to do it, you know, to raise the crops that we need for, for human consumption and for livestock consumption. So th there's always going to be uh, some sort of a negative impact, um, you know, related to agriculture. But, you know, hopefully uh, as our practice has changed, our impact reduces. How much of an impact is that on you guys financially where they're saying, with a wink and a nod, guess what you're doing now? You're doing this. You're t you're not tilling anymore, and you're gonna use herbicide. Um, did you have this equipment already? Do you get reimbursed for the equipment? How does that whole process work? Yeah, that that's a whole can of worms. But the the, the short answer would be um, some of the equipment we already had, um, some of the stuff that we had to upgrade. There are a lot of um, government incentives out there to help make those upgrades. Um, you know, it's a good thing. You know, just we're a small operation, you know, and I'm not I'm not going to get into finances too deep, but I'd like people to have a little bit of an idea what this stuff costs. Yeah. You know, we're a small operation. Our drill that we put our wheat, sow our wheat with um, is only 10 feet wide. That's that's a small drill. And it was like 20, 26,500 or something like that is what that drill costs. And it was used, you know, so when you look at some of these big, bigger operations, uh, you know, a, a big tractor pulling, pulling a big air seeder or a, a big piece of playing equipment. It doesn't take long till you, till you have a couple hundred thousand dollars out there in the field. You know, it is expensive. That's insane. Um, but there's also a fuel savings, um, you know, because we're not burning the diesel to plow and that sort of thing. So it, it's not, it's not a wash necessarily. Um, but it's also not the end of the world. And, and we do like it. We do like, um, having a no-till operation. Um, but the truth of it is it does come at the cost of, of, of more herbicide application. And, and I just think it's just so interesting because I feel like so many times people want to want to have a conversation without having all the facts and knowing everything. And when you're like, well, let's blame, you know, a farmer for let's do no-till, let's do more herbicides. It's like, well, Maybe that wasn't his decision. Maybe now you're blaming him for something where it was kind of somebody else that is pulling the strings and say like, well, we should go this route and then you guys have to do it. And it's just so interesting that people don't stop to just ask the right questions. Yeah. And, and this, this topic is a lot deeper even than, yeah, I mean, I could do probably two or three podcasts just on, <laughs> yeah. just on this topic, you know, but um, there were farmers that were already adopting um, because it is faster, you, you can cover more acres, um, by doing the no-till system because tillage takes so much time and so much fuel. Uh, so it was already kind of attractive. Um, but then we can also go into the fact that because commodity prices, you know, corn, soybeans, all that stuff, it, it, the, the profit margins are very low. So the, the pressure on a farmer is to take on more acres and take on more land. You know, so that he can make his living and that drives the need to be able to get over those acres faster and more efficiently and sort of feeds into this whole thing of, you know, uh, advancing that no-till, um, you know, planning system that has more herbicide applications. Like there's a big feedback loop um, that, that's both economic and governmental, um, you know, that sort of feeds into that. But, you know, so back to the pollution thing. I mean, definitely there's pollution that comes off of farms, but you know, we're certainly not the only source. Um, you look at, you know, municipal, uh, you know, waste treatment plants, um, 
you know, there's commonly footage that people shoot with their iPhones of raw, raw sewage mm-hmm. going down the Susquehanna. And I'm sure it probably happens t- at times in the Juniata and, um, you know, lawn fertilizers and other businesses that, that cause pollution. And, uh, you know, I'm not trying to give anybody a pass. You know, I, I think it's just something that we have to look at realistically and realize that there, there is no silver bullet. Um, you know, the solution to long-term healthy watersheds is, is to sort of bring everybody along, you know, that everybody's doing the best that they can. And that's where the real advancement, in my opinion, comes from. It's just, it's so, you know, before, you know, having this conversation with you, it just, you help recontextualize everything where it's like, yeah, if you want less phosphorus in the water, okay. But the date with devil is more herbicides in your food. And it's just like, you're right. There's just no, we try so hard to find a silver bullet, but it's, you know, that's not possible right now. Yeah. And there's, there's a lot of people out there that are experimenting with some, I, it, I don't know if advanced is the words because in some respects it's, it's going back to the way that, um, at least in some respects, it's going back to the way that some of our ancestors would have farmed. Uh, but it's within the context of, of, you know, modern economies and stuff, but uh, it, adopt adoption of new practices is difficult because farmers have so much money invested in the operation that they have now, you know, and, and time spent learning the systems that they have now. And there's a huge financial risk to leave a system where you're you're making your living and go to something that maybe is better or maybe not, but you're risking your farm on it one way or the other, you know, and I, I don't think people are sympathetic to that. You hear people talking about, you know, regenerative agriculture and, and a lot of things like that. That's a big uh, term that's thrown around a lot today or, or organic, you know, those those types of things. And while they may be great things, the reality of it is for the guy that's already out there making his living farming, to switch, he has to bet his farm on it. Could you and could, could you that's highlight a huge that? Risk. Yeah, highlight that because I think Will Harris uh, is his name. He was a farmer and he brought that to attention on I think the Joe Rogan experience where he talked about regenerative farming and and runoff. And he he threw an image up that had like 15 million views of his farm had clean runoff versus another farm had muddy runoff. And I don't think people could you articulate that a little bit more for a person that just doesn't understand? Like, what do you mean by regenerative farming? Yeah. And even even that question is a, is a little bit loaded because you can listen to a bunch of podcasts and YouTube videos on, on what exactly regenerative is. And I can't necessarily define it. Um, I, I mm. guess the way I would define it for the purpose of, of what we're talking about today is it's what the what today's visionaries see as the solution to some of the problems that we're currently experiencing. And we'll just leave it within the loose context of that, you know, and but like, you know, on the flip side of that, um, you're talking about the guy that has the regenerative farm and has clean runoff water. The the water that leaves our no-till farm looks clean. Now, is it carrying things with it? Possibly, maybe, you know, I I don't know how much or what or anything like that. but it still looks clean. It's not carrying sediment. So, you know, there's all kinds of things, you know, where, whereas if that particular regenerative farmer, and I don't know him, I shouldn't even, probably shouldn't even say this, but, you know, if he happens to have livestock that are maybe not in a stream bed, but close to a stream bed, you know, runoff from their manure could still be reaching the stream and the water can look clean, you know? So there's, I don't know. It, it, it's a big, the whole pollution thing uh, with agriculture is, is such a, a broad topic uh, and there's so many contexts to look at it in. Uh, but I think the big takeaway is I think everybody should sort of be self-critical. Um, mm-hmm. t- take a look at, at what they're doing and say, how can I do a better job? And, and I don't care whether that's a farmer or, or whether it's a person that's, you know, fertilizing their lawn or you're dumping drain oil down the city sewer, you know, whatever it is. There's 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 all kinds of places for for people to be better. And, you know, one of the things that, that we did talk about there you know, right before, um, right before we went live was I can take you to places on the Juniata river, which in the grand scheme of things is not a huge watershed, but I can take you out there to places where there's storm water or, um, high water eddies, you know, like up in the, up in the trees and up in the brush. And there's maybe a hundred thousand plastic single use water bottles laying up there. And I can tell you, farmers did not put those there. Yeah. You know, that, that came from 
that came from other people. So, um, you know, everybody's got something that they can do better without yeah. a doubt. And, and the only way that you can get to it and, and break down what I like to call the doc talk or the drama is by just having open discussions about this in long form. And so people can understand this a little bit better because sure. you know, the, the, the crap that you, the farmers have to go through just to make a living on top of all the regulations is insane. And, and this will be, this is a question that popped into my head. Like when we first started, would it be harder to farm in the Chesapeake Bay watershed or out West? Because I feel like the, the regulations on the Chesapeake Bay watershed are just insane. They are. And they're, they're, they're probably not ever going to get any better. Uh, when, when I say better, I guess I just mean less restrictive. And I mean, I think you can probably get away with more, um, you know, in the Midwest or out West. And, you know, there's a lot of things that, that play into that. You know, some of it is the, is just the position within the landscape and some of it's lobbyists too. You know, I mean, there's, there's a pretty strong environmental lobby for the Chesapeake Bay, probably as there should be. Um, you know, and that trickles its way up the drainage, up through the Susquehanna and the Juniata and the West Branch and all the way up into New York, um, you know, and all the Delmarva, you know, the whole the whole watershed kind of feels the heavy hand of of sending their water into the Chesapeake. Um, whereas in the Midwest, you know, I would imagine that in Iowa, in Illinois and in Indiana, there's probably a pretty strong agricultural lobby um, that maybe keep some of those regulations at bay um, that, that we have to deal with here in, in Pennsylvania. But then maybe that comes at an environmental cost, you know, as well. So it's, they're complex topics. Yeah. You know, they, they it's really a are. complex topic. They really are. And guys, you know, this is something I'm going to be talking more and more on this show. I want to get the um, I'm going to get the Pennsylvania River Keepers, Pennsylvania River. I'm going to get the Susquehanna River Keepers on here at some point to break down the river and just start talking to Pennsylvania uh, biologists as well, just to kind of talk about this because I think we need to really shine light on all these issues, have this this complex conversation, and even also bring hopefully some corporate heads into it because you're not the first person to set about you know seeing the pollution, but you can't do anything. I had a uh, Mark. I think uh, Wandor, uh, Waldorf on for Shenandoah River Keepers, they talked about a credit system that corporations have where they can buy credits to be like, yeah, we pass. It's like, bullshit. No, you didn't. <laughs> like, that's really yeah. shady. I mean, so yeah, I mean, there's just, it is. It's a very complex topic, but, you know, we have to have it. We really do. Yeah. You know, and, and on the other side of that, you know, there's a lot of other regulations. Um, you know, we don't have near the direct discharge sewage systems that we used to have, you That's know, true. along the Juniata River or its drainages. There used to be a lot of people with, with pipes out the backyard and through the river bank, you know. Um, there's a, there's an old train station just a couple miles up the river from here. And uh, from what I understand, they used to, to stop the trains there and, and they would just empty the, the cars when it was the Amtrak trains. They would just, you know, run it down over the bank. Um, that kind of stuff isn't happening anymore. So we, I think you had a guest on Forgive me if I'm wrong, but uh, do you have a biologist on here like just a couple of days ago or something like that? Yes, I and, had. Uh, yeah, I had Joe Love. He he runs the Maryland yeah. Department of Wildlife Resources. Yeah, but, but he he said let's let's take a little time to celebrate the positive improvements that we have yeah. made. You know, it's been a long time. That, that's the quote I remember. It's been a long time since I've seen a river on fire, and uh, I think there we should be yeah. celebrating certain things, but we shouldn't be turning a blind eye necessarily to, to other places where we can make improvement either. I, th I think, you know, environmentally, um, what do you want to say? That, that's a, it's a journey, not a destination. You know, yes. you're, you're probably never going to, you're never going to get everything taken care of, but you always want to be, you know, kind of moving in that direction and trying to better things. So. Alan, amen. I mean, that's that's really wise words to really look at with all these issues because, yeah, it's been a while since we've seen a river on fire, and that's uh, hopefully that never happens. Um, yeah. <laughs> do you have any fishing goals for next year? Anything you want to break? A smallmouth PB, something like that? Um, yeah, just more fish. <laughs> now, uh, no, uh, on the smallmouth side of things, I've been I've been trying harder to to target larger fish. Uh, I'm kind of past the point where the numbers really matter too much to me. Um, uh, I actually just, this is almost embarrassing. There, there's a lot of good sticks up this way and uh, I hope to eventually be in their ranks, but I'm not there yet. But I actually just caught my first 20 incher here uh, a week or so ago. Congratulations. Um, 
more, more 18s and 19s than you can shake a stick at. But I just I couldn't get over that 20 inch barrier. And, you know, so, and this is kind of going back to the Susquehanna. We, you had talked about, you know, is the Juniata similar to the Susquehanna? One of the big differences that I see, because we from where I live, we can take a couple back roads and within 15 minutes, we can be sitting at Liverpool on the Susquehanna. Um, so we've been doing some kayak trips out there. I'm afraid to take my jet boat out there, man. That is Ledge Rock City. And th- th- those, those babies would be like a can opener on, on my boat. Um, but the Susquehanna, at least between, say, like, um, you know, Sealands Grove and, and Duncannon uh, or City Island. Let's, let's just go all the way down to City Island. There's so many defined targets to cast to. You know, whether it's a ledge system or a grass island or uh, the tips of wooded islands, um, riffles, shoots. There's just it's it's like a wonderland. You can be out there and there's so many things to cast at. If you're floating by them just under paddle power, you know, without a torquedo or anything, you can't even dream of casting at all the targets. There's so many targets to cast to. The Juniata still has targets, but they're a lot more... Um, nondescript i mm-hmm. guess would be the word subtle um yeah there's they're very subtle uh the eddies are subtle um there's boulders under the water that hold fish all the time but you can't see them um there are a few ledge systems that you can fish you know like you would fish on the susquehanna but the i guess what i'm saying this is a roundabout way of saying that i think it's a little harder maybe to consistently catch the biggest fish um on the Juniata because there's so many places they can be and you can't see where those places are all the time. Gotcha. Um, and, and it does bring up one thing that was, that was one thing I did want to bring up um, about the Juniata. We have a lot more, I'm going to say it was probably a COVID thing, um, but we have a lot more pressure now than what we used to, um, you know, kayaks all the time, man, kayaks, just the river's filthy with kayaks and I'm not complaining about it. Um, people need to be out there and appreciate the resource in order to protect it. Right. So, um, I'm, I'm glad they're using it. Um, but there's, there's a lot of people out there. And so I think one of the things that kind of happens sometimes with those larger fish, and and when I'm talking large, I mean, I'm talking your, your 20 inch plus fish, um, they do get caught. And then I think they start to figure out pretty quickly what boat traffic is, you know, and they, they, get they start to get where yeah. I, I think it takes a, a long, precise cast <laughs> a lot of times to pick those fish up or, or a, a very stealthy approach. It's it, it's tough just to luck right into them. So that's I, I would definitely like to pick up more of those 19 and 20 inch fish. Uh, I want to spend more time on the Susquehanna. That that place is is just it's amazing. Um yeah, basically as much time in the water as I can get it. It it makes me happy. Lowers the stress levels. It it, it does. And and hopefully, you know, this coming year, you know, you're gonna be cracking that that big 22, 23 inch smallmouth that that's so famous for. And maybe you'll catch the new Susquehanna state record flathead because it feels like a new state record or world record's coming every other week <laughs> at this point. It's insane how many times that keeps getting broken. Yeah, and it's it's all kind of in the same general area too. I, I have a couple of contacts from down that way who I've I've not met personally yet, um, but they've they've offered to to show me the ropes, and I'm I'm kind of waiting until the maybe that sort of September range. The bite usually picks up as the water temperature starts to drop, and uh, maybe go down there and and give that a shot and see if I can pick something up. That's uh, I'd like to get one over thirty pounds anyway. Um, our, our biggest here in the Juniata is twenty and a half. And, and I know of maybe two or three um, that are bigger than that from sources that I trust. Um, so we just, we have a lot of fish, but we don't have any of the big ones yet. And you got, got to go south on the main stem of the Susquehanna to get into those really, really Goliath flatheads. Well, I think you're going to get one of those too. Alan, again, yeah. I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. Uh, we, we've, we've covered such a wide variety of topic of topics. Is there anything else that, that you wanted to hit on or anything else you wanted to plug? No, <laughs> no, no, I got, I got nothing. I'm not in the industry. I'm not a guide. I don't, I, I just fish cause I like to. And, um, 
Yeah, I mean, I guess the only thing I'd say is if there's anybody out there, you know, I'm not like a super experienced angler. I'm, you know, three years or so of going hard at it. And, um, you know, if there's anybody out there that wants to learn how to fish, become a consumer of information. There's so much out there with, um, you know, podcasts and YouTube. And, you know, I know you've had uh, you've, you've had Jeff Little on go to his channel, man, the little stuff, YouTube channel. There's like an encyclopedia of incredible river fishing information, uh, there to be had. Um, and you know, be a consumer of information, but at the end of the day, there is no substitute whatsoever for time on the water. You know, try to learn your concepts and get out there and apply them, uh, find out where they fall short, find out where you need to do better. Um, you'll be intentional about it and you'll, you'll get there. I mean, I'm not there yet, but I'm getting there. And, and it's, it, it, it's nice. It's nice to go out and, and have an expectation to put fish in the boat every time you're out. It's always a quest for knowledge. And it's a, it's a quest that like you, like we said earlier to tie that back, it, it's not a destination it's a journey and it's the journey for knowledge. And hopefully that continues your whole life because you, you'll never get enough of it. Yeah. Without a doubt. It, it's what, it's what helps keep you young. It really does. Alan, again, thank you so much for coming on the show. Everyone, please like and subscribe to the channel. Also check us out on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and iHeartRadio. We'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.